let's talk some more about thrust versus cut. So throughout the 19th century, and in fact even earlier than that, obviously if we go back through the centuries, 18th, 17th, 16th centuries, um, into the Middle Ages to an extent, although I'll talk a little bit about why it's not so applicable once we go um, before the 16th century, shall we say. But um, from the 16th century onwards, we start to get specialised thrusting swords becoming more prevalent, more common. We could say that there were specialised thrusting swords before this. Again, I'll talk a little bit about more, that, more of that in a minute. Um, but we start to see more of an obvious division between people who preferred swords that were either cut and thrust swords or especially specialised in, uh, if that's even a phrase, in, in cutting um, capacity and swords which were specialised in thrusting capacity. Now obviously I'm holding two 19th century swords here um, but obviously that's typified in the, shall we say, the 17th century by the contrast between rapier and backsword and in fact if we look at um, treatises of the period um, we see very much that this is a, a feature of those treatises. It often, uh, if it's a rapier treatise, it will often deal with um, accentuating the use of the point, whilst they also, in rapier treatises, do have cuts, because the rapier is a cut and thrust sword. Um, but nevertheless, the weapon, the rapier, by definition, really, is more specialised for, for the thrust. It's elongated and narrowed, um, such that it is got a great, it's got a greater reach and is more nimble at the point, generally speaking, um, uh, which is obvious, uh, both obviously features that um, advantage, give advantage to the person who's going to predominantly use their point. Whereas cutting swords, by their very nature, um, tend to be broader. They tend to need to be broader to still have a decent cutting capacity. Now, obviously, there are. Um, there are parameters that vary within cutting swords. You can have at one extreme end something like a falchion or a, um, a langmesser, like I've shown in uh, previous videos of mine. Um, or indeed, you can have a very curved blade, like a, like a sabre or certain types of, you know, shamshir, tulwa, uh, what some people would term scimitars, things like this. Um, Kilich, for example, as well, where they are very clearly also specialised for the cut. Not necessarily particularly broad, but they do nevertheless have curved blades, which um, are, for numerous reasons, um, better for cutting with and clearly not so good for thrusting with. Not to say you can't thrust with them, as I've talked about in previous videos, um, but, um, but nevertheless they are not very well adapted to thrusting with because the point is not in line with the hand and arm. Whereas a straight sword very clearly is. Now, um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, this became almost a point of obsession for people who were interested in swords, and you find people writing on the subject who throw all of their lot in with one or the other, um, particularly in 19th century um, military circles and fencing circles that I study. Um, it very much becomes a point of argument, in fact, between um, whether you should be using a cutting sword or a thrusting sword. Now, I have seen diverse statements made on the topic. Um, clearly, my favourite word, context, is a massive underlying part of why different people preferred one thing or the other. In terms of 19th century sources, the general consensus is that for fighting on foot, a um, straight sword is better and predominantly using the thrust is better. That's in Europe, that is. Um, so, in, even, even I'd go even further, in Western should we say central, western and northern Europe, um, that's the prevailing opinion. It wasn't necessarily the prevailing opinion in Eastern Europe, although having said that, whilst sabres famously um, were popular in parts of Eastern Europe and parts of Central Europe as well, um, they did also use small swords and rapiers in Poland and Russia and um, uh, Ukraine and uh, Latvia and all of those places, they did also have straight swords there. So it wasn't that just simply you found curved swords in the east and straight swords in the west. It wasn't like that. You found curved and straight swords in both, um, in both all areas of the world. Um, but the, it, limiting ourselves to the sources which I predominantly look at, so Western and Northern European, um, and American in fact, because that effectively counts as, uh, as European at that point in time, um, uh, they do generally advise that a, um, a straight 
sword, um, a thrusting centric sword is better on foot. But on horseback, they have varying opinions. Um, if we look at uh, someone like, uh, should we say, Colonel Fox is an example, um, one example I can think of, um, and allegedly um, Napoleon himself, um, they did advise using the point on horseback. And of course, we know that towards the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, lots of cavalry swords became thrusting swords. They became uh, skewers, essentially, S-docks, um, for delivering point. Now, I have argued in previous videos that that's partly because of the changing use of cavalry in those periods, and I, and I would stand by that point. Um, if we look at lots of the famous cavalry cultures from the world, whether it's the Mongols or you know the uh, the Marathas, the the Sikhs, um, we look at the various um, Arabic nations. We look at Persia, uh, we look at Poland, um, Russia, the Cossacks. What type of swords are they using? Yeah, pretty much curved swords universally. And this was the counter argument made by some 19th century authors. Um, one example being uh, John Jacob. Um, of the Sindh, um, of, of the Sindh, the governor of Sindh, I think he was, but he initially of the Sindh irregular cavalry, and um, the the argument went round and round in circles as far as cavalry swords were concerned. And on one hand, the people who favoured the thrust said that um, giving thrust is the most sure way. This was putting in a nutshell. This was their argument: giving thrust was the most sure way of killing an opponent as quickly as possible um, and with the greatest reach and everything else. Um, the counter argument to that was on horseback. The problem with giving thrust is whilst there were various means of just demonstrate so that the advised method of if you're on horseback and you know, going along like it's exactly like tent pegging or um, uh, uh, jousting at the quinte and this type of thing. You give point with the sword and as you pass the opponent you let the arm go through and the point drag itself out of their body. If, if you're aiming low, then you have to do this without the sword because I'll hit the ground because I'm not sitting on a sword. It, uh, sitting on a horse? Don't sit on a sword, people. Um, but if you're aiming low and skewering someone who's standing on foot and you're up on a horse, then you let the arm go through backwards. If it's someone else on horseback on this side, you let the arm go across around there. If it's someone on this side of the horse and you skewer them over here, you let the arm pass off that way. So. There's a certain method, and it's exactly like tent pegging. If you if you search on YouTube for videos of tent pegging, it's fantastic to watch, incidentally. Um, then you'll see how they use swords or lances, in other words, when they use the point, uh, moving fast on a horse and going past. But uh, John Jacob's argument was that the problem was um, the speed that you often encountered an opponent when they were riding at you as well. Uh, he had an encounter and he was an experienced cavalry commander, it has to be said, despite the fact that um, Sir Richard Francis Burton criticised John Jacob. I have issues with Burton, uh, I've been very clear about that in lots of my videos, but uh, despite the fact that Burton criticised him, John Jacob was an incredibly experienced um, commander of native cavalry forces who very much knew what they were doing. Um, but he said that he gave point on horse uh, once and that he would never do it again because what happened is the opponent um, basically collided so quickly and forcefully with the hilt of his sword that it bent the sword and knocked it out of his hand and I believe he says it was only retained by the fact that it had a sword knot, uh, a sling essentially attached to his wrist, um, but the sword was ruined and he said after that he would only cut. And you can interestingly see that lots of the officers in the Cinder Regular Cavalry had curved sabre, sabre blades instead of the regulation straighter cut and thrust blade. Um, so lots of uh, cavalry nations in history have used curved swords because of course the advantage of curved sword is you can, you can naturally draw it across um, an opponent as you, as, you, as you pass them and their body will pass along or through, over, round the edge as you pass. So it will naturally clear itself out of the opponent's body um, or the horse's body if you aim for the horse um, as you go past. And in terms of giving point, there's another point. This is, this is described in reference to some uh, Middle Eastern swordsmen on horseback where they give point kind of with the edge like this and if you look if I give give point or point you point my blade towards you towards the people watching this, you can see that what I'm actually presenting is the edge about there. And if I hit you at speed, what's going to happen is you're going to collide with the edge and then slide right the way down that sharp edge. So it becomes a push cut. So we talk a lot about drawing cuts, but this now becomes like a pushing cut because the horse is providing the speed. So we can give point on that side, shunk, and it will slide up the blade. 
And there's a fam well, famous account, there's an account um, in, you can find it in Swordsman of the British Empire, the book that I often uh, pimp on this channel, um, where it describes someone being beheaded in this manner. Um, so, curved swords have lots of advantages on horseback. But, as I've said, for various reasons, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, European forces, for the most part, switched to straight thrusting blades. Not like a small sword, obviously it's a cavalry sword, but nevertheless a straight thrusting blade. But I guess the point I want to say um, is that one of the main things to accentuate is whether your um, whether you favour curved blades or whether you favour straight blades, and I would say if you're fighting, if we come back to context, if you're fighting in melee situations, generally speaking, a cutting sword is going to be better than a thrusting sword. If you're fighting one-on-one, -on -one, maybe a specialised thrusting sword will have the advantage. This uh, certainly seems to have been the view by the 19th century in Europe, um, and that, you know, dueling swords pretty much were light and straight. Whereas war swords, battle swords, if we look at the Napoleonic period, this is an example, flank officer's sabre, were curved, very curved. Um, because the people out there in the field that found that if you were in a pell-mell melee, actually what you wanted to do was keep, keep cutting. And one of the advantages of cutting, I've spoken about this before, is the act of cutting is also a defensive motion because it forms curved lines across yourself the whole time. So as well as offending, it's also knocking things out of the way. The problem with the thrust is not only does it extend your body, so if someone attacks you from this side, you're now a nice long target for them to lop your arm off or anything else. Um, it, it's also very monodirectional, okay? So you're completely committing yourself to attacking in one line, um, and people attacking from any other direction see a very extended target. Um, it's very difficult to change direction as well. If I attack someone here and someone attacked me from here, oh, I've got a long way to get my weapon back to defend or indeed to then attack them over there. Whereas with a cut, if I cut someone here, quite naturally, it, it's quite quick and easy to continue the motion and come around and attack people from any direction very quickly and easily. Not the case with a thrust. And we find this talked about in Renaissance period or late medieval and Renaissance period, um, treatises, if we look at uh, Filippo Vardi, for example, he talks about if you're faced with multiple opponents, don't thrust, only cut. We look at uh, De Grassi, when De Grassi talks about the use of the big two-handed sword, he advises using it like a spear, practically, in, uh, against a single opponent, but against multiple opponents, he instantly switches to using it like a giant longsword. So, Clearly in fencing terms and defence terms, there are different pros and cons to thrusting versus cutting. But what I want to finish off with, a thought about, and I have, again, I've talked about this in previous videos. Uh, before I come back, to, I am going to come back to that point about medieval swords, just to, at the very end. But the point that I want to leave you thinking about is about wounds. Um, and the reason I mention this is because I have read, I'm, I'm going through lots of primary source reading at the moment and I've come across several accounts which specifically talk about the um, effect that a thrust can have an opponent if you hit them in the right spot. And it's interesting because this goes contrary to lots of other things I've read. So the thing about thrust seems to be that either, depending where they hit, either they do very little or they just drop someone. <laughs> and this of course in HEMA or any other type of martial art is very difficult for us to simulate. If I land a thrust in someone's chest, we don't really know what that thrust would have hit. If it went straight through their heart, it's very likely that person is going to drop really, really quickly. Okay? But if it went through one of their lungs, or even skidded around their ribs and maybe just, you know, slightly perforated one of their lungs, rather than straight through the middle kind of thing, it's possible that they might keep fighting for quite some time, or it's possible that they might just go, holy fuck, I've been stabbed, and drop, okay? We just don't know, we can't simulate that, and we can find from historical accounts and modern, unfortunately, modern crime and modern war, we can find it's a similar thing with gunshot wounds. You can shoot two people in the same spot and they'll react differently. Their build, their constitution, their kind of health, um, their mental state, whether they're... Um, you know, shocked, surprised, angry, 
uh, whether they're drugged up, drunk, all this kind of, how fit they are, all sorts of things, how used they are to taking pain or whether they've received injuries before. Um, you know, I've mentioned the famous, um, there's several accounts from the Second World War of people being shot and falling down dead and then realising that they're not dead and getting back up again. Um, so you can condition people to believe that when they're wounded, they'll drop down because that's the end of them. But equally, you can condition people the other way to, to just fight like tigers and, you know, go down to the last drop of blood kind of thing. So their mental state and the way they've trained and their past experience definitely has a big part in it as well, a big part to play in it as well. But uh, really just to say, we don't really know at any point what a thrust might do. It might go through a vital organ, it might not. Um, it might drop a given person uh, at another time. It might not drop that given person. Um, the same wound could have different effects on different people. So we don't really know what the thrust is going to do. But um, to make my point, because I realise I'm rambling a bit here, um, the the a lot of period accounts talk about thrusts dropping someone, but cuts not. And this is sort of surprising to me because I would have naturally expected cuts to have more percussive force and more sort of knockback force than the thrust because. When we're fencing, very often people don't notice that they've been, been thrust because we use flexible blades, so you poke them, the blade thrusts, and they go, ah, bam, and they hit you with a cut. And you're like, okay, that was a double or an after blow, but do you realise that you've just been thrust through the body? Oh, no, I didn't see that. I didn't feel that. Because through the padding and using the weapons we use, sometimes you just don't feel thrusts. Um, I, I even though sometimes if you thrust someone in the side of their mask, they don't notice it. But anyway... Um, Whereas when you hit them, they always notice it because they've just been big percussive force whack, okay? But um, in actual fact, it seems from the, at least from the 18th and 19th century sources, that very often people would take slashes and be fine. They'd be absolutely fine. Now, there's several layers to this. First of all, obviously, 18th, 19th century surgery was better equipped to deal with cut wounds than thrust wounds. So even if you were run through with, you know, if, if you weren't put out of action immediately by a cut or a thrust, you, your recovery from the cut is more likely to be assured than uh, your recovery from a thrust, because a, a thrust through your body is more likely to get infection, it's more likely to have created internal bleeding, injured an internal organ that they have no way of fixing. So medically you're more likely to be screwed from a thrust than you are from a, from a cut. But talking about just within the fight, ignoring future medical conditions, just within that fight, there are lots of accounts, McBain is famous for saying this, that people can take lots of cuts and be okay. Now clearly, not if you lop their arm or leg off or clearly their head, not if you sever an artery, but most of the time that's not what cuts do. Most of the time cuts historically seem to have just opened someone up in a certain place, you know, in a shoulder, across the ribs, across the thigh, even in the head, even head wounds. Um, and it seems that lots of people survived cuts in combat but not that many people survived thrust. Now, I'm not going to talk about stopping power anymore because that's a separate topic. I have spoken about it before, but I'll talk about it again. The final thing to finish off with is medieval swords. So, as I mentioned, we do start to see increasing specialisation of um, thrusting swords and cutting swords from the 16th century onwards. In fact, we see the beginning of, well, we see that going right the way back into history. We can sit in the Bronze Age, all the way through, ever since swords have existed, there have been some swords which are better geared towards cutting or better geared towards thrusting. Things like the Bronze Age leaf blade, uh, which I'll talk about more in a future video. I've done a video on, for the Patreon about that already, but um, that is a compromised design. It's good at thrusting, good at cutting, and there have been lots of compromised designs. The Gladius Hispaniensis is a good example of a compromised design. The Spartha is a compromised design. Uh, but things like the uh, Falcata or Coppice are more specialised to cutting. Um, and then if we go through into, let's say, the, the so-called Dark Ages, so the Viking era, Anglo-Saxon period, those swords, Type 10 blades, oak shots, Type 10, they're more geared towards um, cutting, really, than thrusting. Although they can thrust, but they're more geared towards cutting. Clearly, uh, falchions uh, are more specialised to cutting. Not that they can't thrust, but they are weighty at the tip, so they're not very good at a nimble point play. But things like when we get into um, rapiers and small swords, they're clearly designated thrusting swords. In the medieval period, although there were some specialised swords, there were S-Docs, the, the first types of S-Docs, there's certain types of um, so-called, you know, double-edged so-called knightly type swords that seem to be slightly going towards specialisation for thrusting. So the Type 17, for example, certain types of Type 15, 
Um, so they're very pointy blades. They do seem to sacrifice some cutting ability in order to increase their thrusting potential and length. Um, whilst that's the case and that specialization begins in the medieval period, it doesn't become really stark, I wouldn't say, until the 16th century. Um, so the 16th century is really when we start to see the beginning of this cut, cut versus thrust debate. And really, just to finish off by saying, as far as we know, as far as we can tell from the source material that we have, this wasn't yet a question in the medieval period. The medieval people just thought, well, a sword is a sword, you know, you might have one that's a bit better at cutting and one that's a bit better at thrusting. But um, apart from the division between single-edged swords, i.e. messers, and double-edged swords, they don't seem to have worried themselves too much about it. They don't, for example, have different longsword treatises or different longsword techniques for different types of longsword blade. They just have longsword treatises. But that's because all of those swords are, in a way, much of a muchness. They can all thrust pretty well, they can all cut pretty well, but they're not dedicated to one or the other. So there we go, folks. So a little bit more thinking about cut versus thrust. I know I've spoken about this quite a bit in the past, and I'm sure I'll speak a lot more about it again. It was a debate that really went through history, but there's some interesting thoughts to come out from it. And really, you know, what would you prefer to use on foot one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, what would you prefer to use in a melee? What would you prefer to use on horseback? I think, again, it comes down to different contexts. I don't think that one sword is better than another. I know people who say that, oh, with a small sword, they could beat any sabreur or backsworder. And I, I certainly know lots of people who believe that, um, that they would have a big advantage with a backsword or a sabre um, or a longsword. Uh, longsword versus rapier, for example. Some people think they'd have the advantage with a longsword, some people think that rapier would have an advantage. I think it depends very much on context and what people are better at as well. A lot of people answer this, oh, it depends on the swordsman. Not entirely true. Um, a better martial artist with a dagger still doesn't stand a very good chance against a new guy with a spear, okay? There are definitely weapons can decide a fight sometimes. And experience plays a part, but it doesn't play the entire part. Um, and I definitely think there are some swords have advantages over others in certain contexts. But as with always, with all these things, it is about context. And I do think that um, talking about which sword is better, we've got to say, okay, in uh, precisely what situation you're talking about is it better and uh, very often for example in the 18th and uh, beginning of the 19th century at least it was common for a gentleman to wear one of these in civilian life for uh, duels and self-defense uh, but to carry one of these on the battlefield so they clearly realized different tools for different jobs cheers folks thank you for watching please subscribe follow us on facebook you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.